the Battle of Edge Hill is not particularly well known. It's, it's often regarded as inconsequential because although the two opposing armies came within yards of each other, neither side was willing to gamble everything on the outcome. Uh, after a day of skirmishing across a field measured by miles, uh, on viewing the American defensive position, the British were willing to call it a day and return to Philadelphia rather than pay the price that would have been exacted if they had continued their attack. Uh, in terms of battlefield casualties, killed and wounded, the battle was on a scale of actions like Princeton, Trenton, Great Bridge, or Green Spring. But the event was certainly not without consequence uh, for those people involved in the fighting or for the unfortunate inhabitants of Pennsylvania whose farms were plundered and homes and barns burnt. Uh, nor was the outcome insignificant for the armies. Not only did the American main force face down their enemies, re retaining possession of the field, but they were able to continue their stranglehold on the occupied city of Philadelphia, eventually forcing the British to abandon uh, yet another untenable position as they had at uh, Boston two years earlier. The indiscriminate burning and looting demonstrated clearly that the frustrated British were fighting in a foreign land, not on their home territory. Uh, the image that we're seeing here, by the way, is a, a sort of a theoretical view of the battle uh, published by Johann Martin Will in Germany in 1778. And uh, it's based on uh, the reports that he received from a participant in the battle. Uh, you might think of this as sort of uh, the 18th century version of Newsweek. It's not completely accurate, but it's uh, evocative of what took place. So uh, the principal antagonists uh, at the Battle of Edge Hill were of course, William Howe and General Washington, George Washington. You know, after three years of war in America, the British had little to show for their, uh, for their effort. Uh, they basically only controlled the land that their army sat on um, or what was within range of their naval guns. Uh, both of these two uh, commanders were highly experienced, very capable men. Uh, George Washington, ignited the French and Indian War with his attack at Jumonville Glen in 1754, first battle of the French and Indian War. And Howe uh, performed admirably during the French and Indian War as a commander of light infantry. He was a big light infantry proponent. He is the guy who uh, led his troops up to the heights at the Plains of Abraham in front of Quebec in 1759, enabling the British to uh, bring their force up onto the plateau there and to defeat the French. And he was also instrumental in the capture of Havana in 1762. <clears throat> These two men uh, had several clashes already before the Battle of Edge Hill. Uh, at the Siege of Boston, Washington was able to drive Howe and his army out of the city by fortifying and uh, occupying uh, the Dorchester Heights with the cannon that had been captured at Ticonderoga. Uh, later that year, Howe came back uh, at, uh, to New York with uh, thousands of British troops and, and the Hessians for the first time and defeated Washington at, at Long Island and then defeated him in a series of battles in the New York area and finally chased uh, Washington all the way across Jersey and Washington crossed the Delaware for the first time with his army into Pennsylvania, took, took all the boats with him so that the British couldn't get across. Um, but uh, Washington's repost at Trenton and then at Princeton um, just uh, weeks later uh, kept the American army alive. And, and, and that was the campaign of the, uh, the 10 crucial days more recently, um, Howe had uh, defeated Washington at Brandywine and at Germantown. And Howe had, a, he had two roles. Uh, he was the military commander and his goal was to um, defeat Washington's army in the field and destroy it so that uh, the, the revolution would end and uh, people would come back to the British fold. Um, but he also it was assigned along with his brother, uh, Admiral Richard Howe as a peace commissioner so he was trying to negotiate peace, but by this time uh, in, in the war, December of 77, he pretty much realized that that wasn't going to take place. And he was ready to hand in his resignation. Uh, however, in order to uh, get Washington into the field, he uh, decided to move from New York. Let me uh, start my pointer up here so you can see. 
there we go. Uh, he uh, moved his army from New York and sailed all the way down to the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay and back up to the head of Elk in August of 1777, landing just 45 miles from the city of Philadelphia and forcing uh, Washington to battle at Brandywine, which as I mentioned, was a defeat for the Americans. Um, uh, however, uh, the British learned from this battle that the Americans would um, fight pretty, pretty well. So uh, although it was indecisive from the point of view that, that Howe was not able to uh, destroy Washington's army, uh, nonetheless, the British held the field that day, and it led to their occupation of Philadelphia uh, on uh, September the 26th, 1777. Uh, there followed a battle in which um, Washington attacked the British Army's outpost at Germantown, uh, ended up as a defeat for the Americans, but again, it was a very difficult fight for both sides. So Washington had suffered a string of defeats in 1776 and another string of defeats in 1777. And politically, his position wasn't all that good. People were start, starting to talk about replacing him. Hal had been uh, you know, tactically successful, but he was frustrated strategically at his failure to end the war. And um, Washington... Uh, had driven pretty much after, uh, after the Battle of Germantown, had driven uh, the British back into Philadelphia. Uh, they set up a series of redoubts north of the city, uh, supported by their infantry units uh, on guard in case the, the Americans would attack as they had at Germantown. And, and while, this is, while this is going on, the British are struggling to open the navigation of the Delaware River so that they can bring supplies up the river to uh, support their army for the winter in Philadelphia. And here we can see Philadelphia's position uh, at the juncture of the Schuylkill and Philadelphia, I'm sorry, uh, Delaware rivers. So Philadelphia is here and out here about 15 miles away between the two rivers is a series of hills above a, a, a marshy ground called White Marsh. Washington moved down here to the White Marsh Hills early in November of 77 and uh, occupied these hills and basically spent his time denying supply to the city of Philadelphia from the hinterlands and threatening to attack as he had at Germantown. So Howe is facing yet another winter bottled up in a port city. Um, by October or November the 15th, Howe's men had uh, destroyed Fort Mifflin on the Delaware and opened up the Delaware navigation. And by early December, Howe was ready to give it one more try to attack and, and destroy uh, the American force. And so um, he occupied, uh, as I said, these uh, high ground at White Marsh. This is a depiction of Washington's uh, alignment. Um, it's somewhat fanciful. It shows the position at White Marsh. Um, usually people criticize it because it doesn't seem very accurate. You'll look at the size of the, uh, the scale of the Wissahickon Creek on this map. It's huge. And of course, the creek isn't anywhere nearly that large uh, and is most many places very fordable. Uh, but nonetheless, this, um, map, if we investigate it uh, carefully, uh, reveals a lot of things about the battle that might not otherwise be known. We know that it was uh, done uh, from the, the words of a German informant who had participated in the battle. And one of the ways we know that is that um, when we see the phonetic pronunciation of some of these names, so here we have Chesunt Hill instead of Chestnut Hill, and uh, Sandy Rum instead of Sandy Run Crick. Uh, these are things that the uh, informant heard but never saw written. So he did his best to uh, explain where he was to J.M. Will, who uh, published this map in 78. Uh, one of the things that people often laugh at is this island in the Wissahickon Creek, fortified island. But in fact, that is not a fabrication. That island really exists. This is a view from that island across the Wissahickon Creek by the mill dam that created the island uh, towards Farmer's Mill, which is the, um, the mill that White Marsh grew up around. So um, 
Washington posted himself on this series of hills, Camp Hill, Fort Hill, and Militia Hill. And across from them towards Philadelphia is another long ridge broken by a few gaps. And this is the Edge Hill Ridge. It runs down past Chestnut Hill, Barron Hill, and down to Conchahawken. Uh, in the 18th century, this place was known as Matson's Ford. But the Lenape name for um, Conchahawken was really the name for Edge Hill. They called it Conchahawken in the old days. So uh, Washington set himself up not on the front line here, uh, of the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Ridge and Valley system, but on the second ridge line. Uh, so he's protected by this swampy valley and any force that was gonna attack him would first need to get over this hill. Uh, this valley, by the way, uh, is full of limestone and uh, was particularly being uh, quarried here at Fitzwatertown uh, as a result in the late 16, uh, 90s in the 1690s they built lime kiln pike the lime kiln road that ran down to philadelphia and supplied uh lime uh, limestone from fitzwatertown and from fort washington or uh white marsh uh, to build the city of philadelphia and this valley runs all the way down to virginia it gets wider and wider as it runs so uh, washington picked a good defensive post here uh he put uh, the main army on uh, Camp Hill, uh, and then uh, part of the army on Fort Hill. Uh, this would be his second line of defense. And then he put the Pennsylvania militia out on the one wing here uh, on Militia Hill. And this is the Wissahickon Creek as it runs down towards the city of Philadelphia. Washington posted his uh, wagons and supply on these roads behind Camp Hill so that they could easily evacuate to the hinterland should he uh, engage in a battle and need to retreat. This is a map showing the order of battle and the general disposition of Washington's force. It's from December 3rd, 1777, just days before the battle. It's found in uh, the orderly book of uh, Virginia General George Whedon's brigade. And uh, you can see that he's got it three lines. His front line is in two wings, the left commanded by General Green and the right by Sullivan. Uh, second line commanded by Lord Sterling, William Alexander. And the third line is a reserve uh, with a brigade under, um, under Glover, John Clover, I think his name was. Uh, this was a brigade of four regiments from the North. And uh, this kind of demonstrates Washington's active management of the army. Um, Glover, had been at the Battle of Saratoga and actually his troops had escorted the captured um, British army uh, into Massachusetts. Uh, Washington called for them immediately once he knew about uh, the battle being over, called for them to come down along with several other um, brigades uh, to join his main army at Philadelphia so he could act against Howe. I wanna show you another view of this vertical, vertically because you can see the layout of the uh, names of the brigades, the various brigades that are involved. So, you know, we have Wayne's Brigade, Smallwood's uh, Brigade. And on the flanks, uh, Washington posted uh, militia, Pennsylvania militia on the right flank and the Maryland militia on the left flank. And he gave directions that um, Morgan's Rifle Corps, which he also brought down from Saratoga, be formed to the left of the Maryland militia and uh, Charles Webb's uh, Second Connecticut Continental Regiment be formed on the right of the Pennsylvania militia. And he gave orders that these corps and the militia are to act in detachment and not in a solid or compact body and are to skirmish and harass the enemy as much as possible. And we'll see in a minute that that's just how he used them. Uh, Washington himself set up his headquarters on the east side of uh, of Camp Hill, at the foot of Camp Hill, at uh, the Widow Emlyn's house. And that house uh, exists today. You can uh, go down there and uh, walk near the house in the, in the park. Uh, this is a mill race that comes off the Sandy Run and runs down towards, uh, towards the Wissahickon Creek. Washington also set up a pair of outposts uh, to uh, gather information about what the British were up to, and also to um, uh, block uh, commerce uh, from uh, going into the city. Uh, so farmers couldn't bring their produce and goods into the city along the main roads. He set up one at Rising Sun, the Rising Sun Tavern, 
where the uh, Germantown Road splits into the old York Road and the Rising Sun Road. And then he also set another one up uh, at the crossing of the Frankfurt Creek, uh, which is um, along the King's Highway to New York. And the creek here is pretty deep. It's not particularly uh, affordable. The uh, Rising Sun Post was under Captain Alec McLean, uh, a legendary figure uh, during the revolution. And uh, McLean had uh, raised and outfitted his own company down in Delaware and mounted some of those men. And they were with him at the Rising Sun Tavern. And at the uh, Frankfurt outpost, at the crossing of the Frankfurt Creek, uh, he had posted uh, Captain Charles Craig of the Moylan's Fourth Light Dragoons. And uh, Craig's uh, company had been raised in Pennsylvania. They knew the ground. And uh, this uh, bridge here, the Frankfurt Bridge, still carries traffic uh, as it has since 1697 uh, up Frankfurt Avenue to the north. Uh, both of these uh, commanders of the outpost stayed in close touch with Washington, and they also fought regularly, regular skirmishes with the cavalry and the Queen's Rangers, and uh, sometimes the Hessian Yagers who would come out uh, to harass the outposts. By early December, both had been warning uh, Washington of Howe's plan to come out once again and attack the outposts, or I'm sorry, the main army at White Marsh. So many people in the city were already aware of Howe's plan to attack White Marsh uh, before the attack developed. Uh, the, the British decided to march out on the night of December the 3rd, but at about 11 o'clock at night, they postponed the march for reasons that are not entirely clear. Uh, the men stood down and uh, didn't march out again and, until the next night at 11, uh, the night of March the 4th. And they headed their column with a pair of battalions of light infantry. Uh, who were usually the first uh, troops to uh, engage in combat. And as they marched out, they marched out towards uh, Fairhill Mansion, which had been burnt uh, just uh, 12 days before. Fairhill Mansion, we can see a, a, a reconstruction of it here, had a cupola on top that the Americans used to observe British actions and activity in the area. And the British came out and burnt that house and, and 11 others. Uh, in November of 77. So as they uh, came out, uh, McLean moved down and set up an ambush right near the Fairhill Mansion, uh, right along the an extension of the Three Mile Run, which if you look at it in other maps, you'll see that it runs all the way up here uh, towards Fairhill. And uh, it, with 180 men, uh, he ambushed the head of the British column. Uh, he had three companies, his own company in the middle, a company under Lieutenant John Cass of the 3rd New Hampshire, uh, another company under Lieutenant John Dover of the 4th Pennsylvania. Uh, Dover was a Philadelphian and knew the ground well. It's at night, and they didn't open fire until the uh, head of the column was within 20 paces, McLean said. That's about 50 feet away, very close. Uh, they, they launched a volley at them and, and uh, continued to fire for a while, throwing the enemy, momentarily at least, into confusion. But of course, the British light infantry um, were used to this kind of thing, and they uh, skirmished and drove off uh, McLean's men uh, back towards Germantown and continued to skirmish back through Beggarstown and up to Chestnut Hill. This is a map that uh, John Andre uh, drew of, of the event. By dawn, the British Army was on Chestnut Hill, uh, about three and a half miles from Camp Hill across the valley. Uh, that morning, Washington sent out a probing force on um, Pennsylvania militia under uh, Brigadier James Irvine, Brigadier General James Irvine, with about 600 men. They followed the path that is today uh, Stenton Avenue and crossed the Wissahickon Creek. And right near uh, the foot of Chestnut Hill, near where Chestnut Hill College is today, they engaged uh, in a battle with the, uh, with the British. The British sent their light infantry down. Um, and a uh, firefight developed. Uh, the uh, light infantry were led, uh, the second battalion of light infantry led by uh, what was Patrick Ferguson's rifle company, about a hundred men clad in green, uh, wielding these new breech loading Ferguson rifles. 
And you can see uh, an actual Ferguson rifle uh, at the Swan Historical Foundation collection at the uh, Washington Crossing Park in, in New Jersey. Um, beautiful, beautiful weapon. Um, so they fired a few volleys back and forth and the light infantry managed to rout the militia, but not before the rifle company lost two killed in action and four wounded. So the, the militia gave uh, pretty good considering that they were not professional troops. Their brigadier, uh, Irvine, was his horse was shot as he was leaping a fence. Uh, he was shot in the hand, lost a couple of fingers and was captured. And the, uh, the light infantry drove the, uh, drove the uh, militia back to Militia Hill. Uh, over the next couple of days, there was a lot of low-level skirmishing and, and patrolling in this valley here of Wissahickon and, and uh, Sandy Run in the White Marsh area. Um, in the meantime, uh, or Charles Craig's cavalry troop out of uh, Frankfurt uh, was raiding behind the, <laughs> the British lines down towards Germantown, uh, picking up stragglers and threatening uh, supply lines and uh, taking wagons if they could. After a couple of days, um, uh, Hal decided that he, he wasn't really gonna be able to draw Washington into battle. Uh, in the meantime, the Pennsylvania militia, some of them were sent off of Militia Hill to Fort Hill to fortify it. And they built a redoubt there in about a day, uh, kind of like what they had done at Bunker Hill. Uh, they, the Americans threw up a redoubt very quickly and they faced it with um, uh, trees that they cut down called abatis. So they cut the trees, uh, sharpened the branches pointing towards the enemy and faced them down, uh, down slope from the, uh, from the redoubt itself so that uh, they could hold up the British troops if they should assault the position. And uh, of course they had a couple of cannon up here and a number of uh, men who would be firing. So uh, they, they strengthened a, and created a very, um, very strong position. Uh, the redoubt exists today. It was sort of dismantled and then rebuilt in the 1930s as a WPA project. So unable to draw uh, Washington off of the hills, um, Hal decided that on the night of the uh, December the 6th, he would try to maneuver around onto Washington's left flank. And so he uh, did a, a night march on the 6th, second night march, and uh, left fires burning along Chestnut Hill and, and a rear guard so that the Americans would not realize he had left. Uh, he marched back down and they, uh, to Germantown. They burnt the villages of Cresham and Beggarstown along the way uh, in frustrated uh, revenge, I guess. And at, uh, at, uh, as they passed the Chew House, they turned northeast up the Abington Lane and uh, they how detached a column under uh, Charles No Flint Gray, uh, the, uh, the, the British hero of the Battle of Paoli, uh, to uh, move towards the American center and towards this part of Edge Hill. But the main force marched up to uh, Abington Friends Meeting and, and the town of Jenkintown, and then they turned north along the Old York Road. And uh, by, by uh, dawn, they were up here in Abington, uh, near the Abington Presbyterian meeting at the intersections of the Old York Road and Susquehanna Road. Um, they had the Light Dragoons in the lead and the Light Dragoons ran into an outpost. Uh, once again, Charles Craig's uh, cavalry troop had been withdrawn after, uh, after the British reached uh, Chestnut Hill. They'd been withdrawn to, um, to Abington uh, the Abington Presbyterian meeting where the British decided they were going to deploy um, was uh, in this old cemetery, which is obviously you can still uh, visit today. Uh, a sign there says that that the Amer American uh, militia uh, skirmished from behind the cemetery walls with the British. Uh, that was probably actually uh, Craig's cavalry uh, doing the skirmishing. Uh, the American outpost was centered on um, a tavern up there uh, that we know as the uh, Americans knew as the uh, square and compass. The British called it the Mason's Arms because of the sign on the symbol, on the, uh, you know, the sign out front, which demonstrated, uh, you know, showed the square and compass, which is the, the Mason's Arms. So uh, Thomas Sullivan reported, uh, he was a sergeant, a British sergeant, 
uh, reported December 7th, the army marched by Germantown about one o'clock in the morning. The van in Maine commanded as before, and at daybreak took post on Edge Hill, uh, one mile distant from the enemy's left, uh, turning their advance picket at the Mason's Arms, where a troop of the Dragoons surprised a party of their light horse. And this event was recorded by uh, a man, Enoch Edwards. Dr. Enoch Edwards was the, uh, an aide-de-camp to uh, General Sterling and also the senior surgeon of the General Hospital for the American Army. Uh, he had been uh, captured at Fort Washington in 76 up in New York and released, and he lived in Frankfurt. Uh, here he was at uh, the Abington Meeting House, Presbyterian Meeting House, tending to the sick. Uh, it was a good place to, uh, to put the wounded and the sick in a nice uh, large building. So uh, Enoch uh, Edwards uh, wrote about this event, and the letter survives. Uh, Abington Presbyterian Meeting House, Sunday morning. This is December 7th. The enemy are moving across the Old York Road about a mile below this place at Jenkintown and continuing on to our left. It appears to be a large body. Their horse was up here about two hours ago, and I believe Captain Craig is taken. His men has gone off and there's no reconnoitering party here at present. I had to tarry here if you have any commands, your most obedient servant, uh, Enoch Edwards. As it turned out, Craig was not actually captured, but he had a close call down uh, near the uh, home of the Jenkins family, which still exists on what's now called Washington Lane in, uh, in Jenkintown. Um, Craig was being pursued by the uh, British Dragoons and um, one of the officers was closing in on him. He uh, found an old overgrown cellar near the Jenkins home and uh, hid there with his horse until they gave up the pursuit and Charles Craig managed to escape to, uh, to fight another day. Meanwhile, a couple miles south, uh, Charles Gray's uh, column is approaching the Edge Hill Gap at Edge Hill Village. He's going down the church road and then gonna turn up the Limekiln uh, Road and move towards uh, Washington's army. And he's uh, commanding about 2,000, 2,500 troops, led again by a group of elite troops and, and then his own third brigade, which is, uh, consists of four British regular regiments. Uh, to counter these, uh, this force, Washington uh, sent out his right flank uh, troops. So uh, Webb's 2nd Connecticut Continental Regiment this is uh, one of their flags. And, um, and they were led by Isaac Sherman at this point. Charles Webb, their colonel, was, was ill. This is, uh, consisted of uh, 400 men and eight companies, 50-man companies. And, um, and they also sent uh, about 1,000 men of the Pennsylvania militia led by Brigadier General James Potter. Uh, as they came out, they started to uh, run into some some difficulties and who was in charge because Potter as a brigadier general outranked Isaac Sherman, who, who's a mere lieutenant colonel, but he wasn't part of the continental establishment. And uh, Sherman felt that his troops should be commanded by him because he's, he's part of the regular continental army. So they were having some disputes about just how to go about doing things. And to add to the confusion, Joseph Reed shows up. Now, Joseph Reed is well known to the army at this time, but he has no formal role at this immediate moment. Uh, he's, he's really acting sort of as a political busybody and complicating matters because he also wants command of this group. Um, he's accompanying the militia. Um, he had been a confidant uh, of George Washington's. Washington had called him uh, to White Marsh to give him advice. Uh, he was sometimes an aide-de-camp, sometimes not. Earlier in 1777, he had been part of the Continental Army as the adjutant general, but by this time he had resigned that position. He's also a Pennsylvania assemblyman, so he's got a lot of political influence, especially among the militia, and he thinks he should be in charge. Um, riding with him and bolstering his status as a potential leader of this group is a, another brigadier general of the Pennsylvania militia, uh, John Cadwallader. Um, uh, he and Reed had been born just months apart in Trenton, uh, and they were politically active in Philadelphia at this time, and they seemed to have a hobby of reconnoitering out in front of the American main forces. So they did this at Trenton, 
uh, before uh, the, uh, Washington crossed at Trenton. Uh, they did it again before the Battle of Germantown. And now they were reconnoitering out in front of the army uh, near White Marsh. Uh, these two men uh, had been apparently pretty good companions, but shortly after this, uh, they, they had a falling out over a debt that was owed by, uh, by Reed to Cadwallader and uh, engaged in a rather unfortunate pamphlet war in the years that followed. Well, the force uh, headed from Militia Hill, the second Connecticut and the Pennsylvania militia, uh, down the uh, axis of the old church road. Uh, at the same time that uh, Gray's column is moving east along church road. And as the uh, Americans crested uh, the hill of Edge Hill here near, near Twickenham, which was uh, the home of Thomas Wharton, the, um, the president of Pennsylvania at the time, uh, they sighted the, the British uh, moving up and turning north into the Limekiln Pike. And here's an old property map, a map showing the uh, properties as they were owned in 1777. And so uh, you can see the militia and second Connecticut coming past uh, Twickenham, which is located about here, uh, Thomas Wharton's property. And, and down the hill, they can see on Christopher Ottinger's property, the British turning north uh, into the Limekiln Pike and uh, Potter says they're swarming across uh, Ottinger's property. So the Americans decide, whoa, wait a minute, we, we need to head these guys off because they're heading towards the, the, main, uh, the main American body at, at Camp Hill. And so they decide to head up uh, this lane here, which is today called Willow Grove Avenue, in a race to see who can get to the gap at Edge Hill first. Here we uh, can see a little more clearly they're moving up, both forces moving up towards this gap here. Um, they ended up, uh, you know, coming together and clashing uh, just at the Edge Hill Gap. The Americans were able to get there first and took post on the high ground. Uh, John Andre left a, a map showing uh, just what took place here. Uh, this is the Edge Hill Ridge, the American positions. And this is the British Army approaching under, uh, under Gray. I'm going to turn it sideways so you can see uh, in relation to some of the other maps that we've seen just what's going on here. You can see the American main line up here on Camp Hill. Uh, you can see um, this is Edge Hill. Uh, Washington, or I'm sorry, Willow Grove Avenue runs up here. Uh, Limekiln Pike comes and meets it at what's called Edge Hill Village. Um, a number of 18th century buildings still there today. And there's a gap here at Edge Hill, and then the hill begins again heading north. So um, Gray de deployed his light troops, the elite light troops at that, uh, to uh, dislodge the Americans from the hill here, uh, because uh, from here they're in musket range of the road that goes through the gap. In the center uh, are uh, the Hessian Jagers. Uh, these are light, light troops being led by uh, the very famous uh, Johann Ewald. And uh, they, came, they were coming up the, the middle and they were uh, sent to uh, attack the second Connecticut here at the edge of the hill. Mm. Uh, these men, uh, Jagers, were originally foresters. Uh, they had tended, to, they dressed in uh, green uh, uniforms. They carried short rifles and hunting swords. They were highly experienced uh, troops, very dangerous troops, often engaged in skirmishing and fighting. And here we see uh, a Yager rifle that's in the Swan Foundation collection at Washington Crossing, in case you ever want to see one. Also with the uh, British, uh, the Yagers rather, uh, they're wheeling a pair of light guns up the up Lime Kiln Road. Uh, these are called amusettes, and they're an unusual sort of archaic weapon, sometimes known as a parapet gun. They would put them on a, at a parapet of a defensive position to uh, basically destroy the enemy's artillery. So these are big rifles. They, they throw a, an inch and a quarter slug, and uh, if they hit the structure of a cannon, they could actually dismount the gun. And that was what they were primarily used for. But here, uh, for some reason, the Hessians have two of them and they, they wheeled them out and they actually deployed them against, uh, against Edge Hill. In, on the um, 
British left flank, uh, another unit was deployed. Uh, this was the uh, Queens Rangers under Lieutenant Colonel John Graves Simcoe. He's wearing a red uniform, but his troops who were provincials uh, raised in America are wearing green uniforms. And we can see uh, a contemporary uh, image of a Queens Ranger rifleman with a light infantry cap and a small rifle. Uh, they moved forward uh, and sort of penetrated the gap between the second Connecticut and, um, and the Pennsylvania militia here. And they uh, were, were formed, the Queens Rangers were formed sort of as a legion. So uh, they had a number of regular musket companies. They had a rifle company, manned dragoons, and uh, a company of kilted Highlanders even. They had seen a lot of service because they were often sent out uh, in advance or on the flanks or in detachment. Uh, and then finally, over here on the uh, British right was a 90-man uh, company of the uh, Light Infantry of the Guard. And these uh, were particularly elite troops. Uh, while the Yagers and the Queen's Rangers were attacking in the front, they moved through the gap and came around on the flank of the Second Connecticut. And we can see the envelopment here uh, on the old property map. So after they, they raced for the gaps and the second the gap here, the second Connecticut's trying to, to deploy up on the hill and Reed begins interfering with their deployment, giving conflicting orders. And just at that moment, um, the second Connecticut is hit from three sides. So um, staff officer Re uh, Reed is in the thick of things. He's an inviting target on horseback and um, the Queens Rangers uh, shoot him, shoot his horse. His horse falls, he falls, mm -hmm. and the Queens Rangers rush to bayonet him. And just at that moment, the heroic Alan McLean shows up and orders a cavalry troop to charge uh, the, the, uh, the Queens Rangers and drives them off. One of the troopers pulls Reed up onto his horse and Reed, lucky to escape with his life, uh, got away, but he's lamenting the loss of his expensive saddle and a brace of pistols that he had to leave on the field. So uh, the Americans uh, killed and wounded several of the attackers. Uh, the envelopment, though, also proved dangerous for the British. So the Yagers wounded a light infantryman, uh, one of the light infantrymen who died a few days later, and they also shot down a Queens Ranger, a uh, Hussar, off of his horse. Uh, he was wearing a, a captured American Dragoon helmet and wearing a green jacket, which is the uniform of the, the uh, fourth uh, Continental Light Dragoons. And they mistook him for an American and shot and killed him. Uh, as a result, um, Simcoe shortly afterward designed a new uh, helmet or hat for his hussars that could not be mistaken for an American one. Uh, it was a very unusual design and, and there weren't very many like this. Um, at any rate, uh, the, uh, in the confusion, the second Connecticut got off maybe two or three volleys, uh, unable, unable to stand the crossfire. They broke, they fled back across the Sandy Run Valley toward the Emlyn House. And seeing the uh, veteran uh, Connecticut unit flee, uh, the, the militia also broke. And... Uh, Potter said the infection catched the militia like lightning. And they too retreated back across the Sandy Run Valley and they went back down along uh, the axis of uh, uh, Church Road once again, uh, crossing the, uh, the property of one of their captains, uh, William Hicks, who was a captain uh, in the uh, Pennsylvania militia from Springfield. Zachariah Green was one of the men in the second Connecticut and he gave a sort of a evocative uh, account of what happened to him. Uh, after he and his brother were wounded at the, uh, at the battle, uh, he said uh, that they made their way down to uh, across the Sandy Run Creek to the Emlyn House. And my wound was dressed in one of General Washington's rooms. And then we left the house to make room for others and took up our lodging in a horse shed and lay on buckwheat straw. The night was sleepless, the cold distressing, and it was difficult to describe the anguish I endured in my shattered bones, but it was for American freedom. The next morning, General Green procured, 
procured rooms for myself and brother where my wound was dressed by the young ladies of the family. Uh, Zachariah Green went on to survive for many years. He lived to be almost 100 and um, became a minister, a Presbyterian minister up on Long Island. So he survived the battle. So two miles north of here on the ridge, uh, Hal had arrived by early morning and inexplicably, he was holding back his main punch uh, and squandering the advantage of surprise. He uh, laid his troops out, uh, deployed them in three lines. The first line, of course, is the, uh, the two light infantry battalions, as always, the first to engage. The uh, second line is, consists of the, the first and the fourth uh, brigades, about, about eight regiments. And the rest of his force, including the Hessians, are involved in his third line here. They deployed at Abington, facing towards Edge Hill, along the axis of the Susquehanna Road. So here's a view of Camp Hill, uh, seen, I'm sorry, a view from Camp Hill, uh, looking towards Edge Hill down the Susquehanna Road. And you can see this uh, hill rises steeply from the Sandy Run Valley. It's heavily forested, the valley's heavily forested, The uh, the hill is heavily forested with uh, old growth forest, uh, difficult terrain. Washington sends uh, Daniel Morgan's riflemen and uh, uh, Mordecai Gist's uh, Maryland militia up to Edge Hill to uh, engage with the, uh, with the British as they start to come down the, uh, the axis of Susquehanna Road. And, um, he sent them here not just to buy time for him to shift his troops more in this direction to where the uh, the main threat was coming, but also to bring on the battle. And uh, Mordecai Gist, uh, here's their uh, deployed into this position here, on the hill in the in the in the woods. Uh, Mordecai Gist uh, explained what Washington's intent was. He said that uh, Colonel Morgan and the militia under my command were ordered to attack the right the right flank of the enemy in order to bring them on in which skirmish uh, the militia behaved with a spirit becoming free men. Uh, Washington wanted this force to engage the enemy up here and then uh, bring a, do a fighting withdrawal back across the valley and bring that British force up against his own force on Camp Hill where he was uh, entrenched uh, in a very strong position. Uh, he was hoping that uh, the British would attack and he would be able to destroy them in this battle, but he wasn't about to come down off the hill. So uh, Morgan's force uh, is moving up towards Edge Hill. Uh, there are several companies of riflemen uh, under Daniel Morgan. The core of this uh, uh, rifleman core, uh, the, the core of this uh, group uh, had formed uh, the first national military force, 13 companies of riflemen from Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia, just a day after appointing uh, George Washington uh, as the commander in chief. Uh, command, uh, Congress authorized this force of, uh, of rifle companies, and they were the very first Continental troops. So, and they formed the core of this uh, rifle group uh, two and a half years later. They're seasoned veterans, uh, fierce frontiersmen, uh, armed with uh, rifles, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, they had been sent north to Saratoga to stiffen gates and to offset the uh, Indians on the British side. Uh, to offset the Indians as woodland fighters. And immediately after Saratoga was over, Washington required their, uh, their return. Uh, this uh, portrait of uh, Morgan is not often seen. This is also a miniature. It, it's also in the collection of the Swan Historical Foundation. It dates to about the time of the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794, when uh, Washington uh, moved his force out to Western Pennsylvania. And uh, Morgan was one of his generals at that time. Uh, some of the uh, riflemen uh, were posted at uh, Joseph Butler's Red Lion Inn in what is today Willow Grove. Uh, William Homer was a schoolboy at the time, and he recalled the riflemen with their fringed dresses being at that place where they were practicing at a mark in the orchard, and that they gave him a hatchet to cut the bullets out from the targets, uh, for which they recompensed them with a few farthings. So the uh, riflemen were constantly practicing their aim, and they were very good marksmen. 
Now here's an image of a Pennsylvania uh, long rifle from the Swan Collection. Uh, rifle armed troops had a couple of advantages. Uh, they had longer range, nearly double the range of a, of a musket, and high accuracy that was given to the, uh, the, the weapon by uh, grooves that were bored into the barrel, uh, what they call rifling. Um, so they could engage the enemy at twice the distance of a musket, and the enemy couldn't return fire if they were musket armed. But they had a couple of disadvantages. One, they took a lot longer to load, about twice the time to uh, load that a, a, a musket would. So you might be able to get off as many as six shots from a musket in a minute, uh, but only three from a rifle. Also, and this is a real disadvantage, they didn't have a, uh, a lug on them, and you could not mount a bayonet on them. So bayonets turned muskets into six foot spears, deadly in close combat. And uh, the favored British tactic at this time was for them to get close to the enemy, fire a volley to disrupt them and charge with their bayonets. Uh, troops without bayonets would be forced to run because otherwise they would be stabbed with these spears. Uh, so at Saratoga, the Americans developed a tactic of interspersing regular musket armed troops with bayonets in among the riflemen so they could resist a charge. This worked very uh, effectively at Saratoga where Henry Dearborn's men accompanied uh, uh, Morgan's men on their, on their exploits against the British. Um, at Edge Hill, however, the Americans only detached about 40 or 50 regulars with uh, the several hundred men of the, uh, rifle, uh, the rifle Corps, but they also detached a pair of cannon. Uh, opposing Morgan's force are the commanders of the two light infantry battalions. Commander of the second battalion is um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Maitland and commander of the first battalion, which was most heavily engaged, Robert, Colonel Robert Abercrombie. Mm -hmm. uh, they move forward and um, as they advance toward the wooded crest, they uh, suddenly uh, were, were shot at a volley from the uh, uh, Morgan's riflemen, which immediately killed four and wounded several other of the light infantrymen. But they, um, they recovered and they charged as they usually do and started to drive Morgan and his troops back off of the hill. Uh, to aid them, uh, Cornwallis sent his own regiment, the regiment of which in addition to being a general, he was a colonel of the 33rd regiment and uh, he sent his uh, own regiment, a very experienced uh, regular unit, to get around onto Morgan's uh, right. Uh, so Morgan begins to give ground, but he's still hoping to lure the British into battle. Uh, George Hanger, who uh, apparently was present at the time, uh, boasted about what the light infantry did. He said, when Morgan's riflemen came down to Pennsylvania from Canada, flushed with success, gained under the, uh, over Burgoyne's army, they marched to attack our right, uh, marched, marched to attack our light infantry uh, under uh, Colonel Abercrombie. The moment they appeared before him, he ordered his troops to charge with the bayonet. Not one man out of four had time to fire and those that did had no time given to load their guns again. Uh, the light infantry not only dispersed them infant instantly, but drove them for miles across the country. Well, this encounter with Morgan was not quite the romp that Hanger and others described. The first light infantry battalion loss for those three days at White Morris was 14 men killed, another 28 wounded, and most of those casualties were suffered here on Edge Hill. Uh, they did prevail, but at a steep cost. This is a view across what is today the Hillside Cemetery from up here on Edge Hill Ridge, looking across the Sandy Run Valley towards the Camp Hill Ridge. Uh, about a mile away, three quarters of a mile away. Uh, Morgan, an excellent tactician, uh, fighted a, uh, you know, uh, uh, conducted a fighting withdrawal across this ground. And uh, many cannonballs were found there uh, in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, the cannon that the Americans had with them made a very tempting target. And the light infantry went after them, but couldn't overtake them. They would periodically form and fire and then, and then move off quickly. Um, so the British are now pursuing uh, Morgan's force and his guns across towards Camp Hill, which is exactly what uh, Washington is looking for. But by the time the light infantry get 
down to the Sandy Run, right at the foot of Camp Hill, they halt and wait for the, the rest of the regulars to catch up. Meanwhile, uh, to the right of Morgan's men on Edge Hill Ridge, uh, Colonel Mordecai Gist uh, is commanding the, um, uh, the Maryland militia. And although this is a militia force, they're being assigned a, uh, a regular uh, colonel from the regular army to command them. Uh, Gist had been active in recruiting these men, many of them uh, from the Eastern shore in Maryland and in training them. And they arrived um, in Pennsylvania, just at the tail end of the Paoli battle. Uh, they performed very well at the Battle of Germantown on the American left flank, uh, fighting against light infantry uh, there. And um, Gist, uh, as I said, had moved up onto Edge Hill Ridge and uh, while the Americans uh, were being uh, attacked by the light infantry, he was uh, trying to fortify his position. Here's a view um, looking uh, up onto the ridge uh, at Reiner Tyson's farm, uh, which uh, you can see in the 19th century. You can see a house outbuilding and barn. Uh, the outbuilding and the barn are still there. House was taken down a few years ago. Uh, so this is uh, Tyson's farm at Edge Hill Gap, and the Americans are forming up on the hill to, to the right of this. That's the Maryland militia. Uh, on top of the hill, uh, this is the highest point in southern Montgomery County, and there are numerous rocky outcrops and boulders exposed along the top. The east face drops very steeply towards where the British would be coming from. Uh, you can still walk up here today. In the 1980s, we were able to preserve about 10 acres. Uh, this land is relatively undisturbed and, and might be a fruitful site for uh, future archaeological investigation. Anyway, um, the 1st Brigade uh, from the 2nd Line advanced along with a number of Hessian units. Uh, over here to engage with um, the Maryland militia. Uh, as Morgan's men withdrew across the Sandy Run, that exposed uh, more, or, uh, Gist's left, and some of the British regular units started marching down the hill, and they, they were able to, um, to, uh, to drive uh, Gist and the Maryland militia off the hill, um, but not before encountering some pretty stiff resistance. So here's um, uh, just a detail from J.M. Will's map of, uh, of the White Marsh encounter. And you can see that um, uh, the British deployed a number of guns uh, near uh, the uh, Tyson's Gap here to help drive the, uh, the Maryland militia away. Uh, there was some fierce fighting uh, up here at Tyson's Gap. Uh, the British, however, managed to drive the Marylanders back across the valley, as well as the uh, Morgan's riflemen. And here we see the earlier uh, retreat of the American uh, force on Washington's right. Uh, the Maryland militia suffered uh, 16 or 17 wounded. Um, the 1st Brigade, which attacked uh, the Maryland militia up here on Edge Hill, they suffered about uh, two two killed and wounded about two, I'm sorry, two killed in action, about 15 wounded and the Hessian losses were not recorded. Uh, by 3 p.m., having driven the Americans off of Edge Hill, uh, the day is growing late, sunset's gonna be at 4.30. Uh, Hal decided to march his army. He lined them all up and marched them three quarters of a mile down to the Sandy Run. Uh, Sandy Run at this time of year is flowing, uh, uh, but it's pretty easy to cross, uh, but it would slow men up under fire. And this runs right along the base of Camp Hill. Uh, from the base of Camp Hill, the British surveyed the American positions. The, the ground rises about 150 feet very, very quickly. Uh, there are 16 brigades at this point of experienced infantry in two lines up on the hill. Uh, these men had bloodied the British at Brandywine and again at Germantown. And here they were positioned behind entrenchments with the Batis facing the enemy. And they also had about 50 pieces of artillery interspersed among the troops. This is um, several times the number of guns that Hal had brought out from the city. And this force was at least four times the number of men that Hal had faced at Bunker Hill. 
and and the the hill was uh at Bunker Hill was only about 60 feet high on a gradual incline. Here, the British would have to march up about 150 feet, very steep. Um, prudently, Howe declined to launch an attack at this point. Today's getting late, and the Americans are in a really formidable position. Uh, it was a terrifying sight. Uh, Major uh, Carl Leopold Bauermeister, who was the Hessian adjutant, wrote about this. He said, I do not know yet even why their artillery remained silent. They could not only hear us approach through the woods where the leaves rustled, but their advanced posts and our skirmishers exchanged many a shot. The Americans were waiting for the British to start moving up the hill and uh, get stuck on these abatis, and they were going to fire on them with a uh, canister and grape shot. It would have been a, a devastating uh, to the troops there. So Washington, uh, had faced down the British for that day. Uh, Howe pulled his men back to um, Edge Hill Ridge and camped for the night. They did leave pickets out in front and there was skirmishing that uh, continued uh, throughout the night, uh, particularly down at Fitzwatertown. Uh, this is the old Fitz, uh, Fitzwater Mill on the Sandy Run, just beyond the uh, crossing of the Sandy Run. And a lot of fighting took place here among the pickets. Uh, not major uh, for, uh, fighting, but if you were one of the uh, one of the uh, small groups who were engaged, it was a deadly, deadly event. Uh, there was a barn just to the northeast of this position uh, that we used to see as as kids. Uh, had a couple of holes in the uh, the stone wall of the barn, and, and we had always heard that those walls were made by British cannons. Uh, next morning. The British decided to march back uh, to winter quarters in Philadelphia. They had failed to accomplish their objectives. Uh, they knew that they weren't going to be able to bring Washington off the hill, and they also knew that they really couldn't attack him in this position. Uh, Washington sent um, uh, a couple groups out to reconnoiter the positions to see what was going on uh, the morning of December the 8th. Uh, Charles-Francois uh, Dubisson, uh, who had come over to America with his cousin Lafayette, uh, was sent to reconnoiter the British position. And uh, though the uh, rear guard tried to fool him and to make themselves look like there were a whole lot of men, he could tell uh, that the British main army had left, uh, along with a number of men that, uh, uh, led by Daniel Morgan, uh, Dubisson and some others, skirmished with the rear guard as they retired towards Philadelphia. And the British had to form on every little ridge uh, the rear guard had to form uh, fire and try to drive back or hold off the American uh, pursuers, even though it wasn't the main army. It was uh, the kind of harassment that Washington had talked about uh, in his orders uh, of December the 3rd. Uh, so uh, the uh, British made their way back down to the junction of Lime Kiln Roads and the York Road at, here at Branchtown. Um, so, uh, casualty figures for the four days vary. Uh, Americans suffered maybe 150 men killed and wounded and another 50 missing in action. Uh, many of those were captured, uh, the missing. Uh, the British suffered about 80 killed and wounded and another 30 or 40 missing, and those were mostly deserters. Uh, the British uh, and Hessians looted and burned as they moved through Cheltenham. Uh, Crossing the Tuckany Creek, they burned uh, some buildings down here in Cheltenham. They burned a number of buildings at Branchtown. Um, Reiner Tyson's uh, experience here at Tyson's Gap uh, was typical. Uh, the enemy seized all of his grain and fed it to their horses, wasting what was not used. Uh, a Rhode Island uh, uh, American uh, Colonel, uh, Israel Angle, who was no stranger to the devastation of war, uh, observed that the, the ravages and destruction the British troops had made was shocking to behold as they had destroyed everything in their power except the buildings and some of them they had burnt. Three days uh, after this uh, series of events on, uh, on Camp Hill and Edge Hill, the Americans pulled up stakes and headed to less commodious uh, winter quarters than the, than the British were headed to out at Valley Forge. But after a string of defeats, they had finally faced down the British Army. Uh, the Americans had uh, reasons to feel hopeful. Uh, they had remained in possession of the field in face of a superior army. 
Uh, the impact on morale was tangible for both sides. The British were frustrated once again, uh, spending men who were hard to replace, spending lives for no tangible benefit, and marching off with nothing to show for their effort. Uh, according to Elias Boudinot, uh, the American commissary of prisoners, he said the British secretly stole into the city suddenly after so long gasconading that they would drive Washington over the Blue Mountains. Uh, ubiquitous... Uh, Private Joseph Plum Martin, who seemed to be everywhere during the revolution, left his account. Uh, we were constantly on the alert and wished nothing more than to have them engage us, for we were sure of giving them a drubbing, uh, being in excellent fighting trim as we were starved and as cross and ill natured as curs. The British, however, thought better of the matter and after several days maneuvering on the hill, very civilly walked off into Philadelphia again. So to those watching from Camp Hill on December 7th, the action may not have seemed like such a big deal. They had seen worse and were going to see more. But it was a different matter for those directly involved in the fighting. Uh, Joseph Morris, a, a major uh, from New Jersey in the uh, in Morgan's Rifle Corps, was shot in the head. Uh, they loaded him onto a wagon and he was jostled in great pain 70 miles back to his home at Morristown, where he finally succumbed on January the 7th. William Homer, the boy, the schoolboy in Willow Grove, saw a wagon load of wounded riflemen being brought back to the Red Lion. He left the schoolhouse and went next door to visit the men that he had befriended. These wounded men appeared in great anguish with bloody garments. The sight so shocked me that I hurried back in dread to the schoolhouse and remained there until dismissed. And years afterwards, Lewis Hurd of the Second Connecticut remembered the battle somberly and simply as that day where so many were killed. I'm gonna close by showing a monument that sits in front of the uh, Tyson barn at Tyson's Gap. Now it's the local VFW. It says, known only to God, the remains of four patriots killed in the Battle of Edge Hill, December 7th and 8th, 1778, 70, 77, uh, during the Revolutionary War, buried here May 30th, 1953. Their remains were brought down off of uh, the part of Edge Hill where the Murren militia uh, had uh, fought off uh, the British uh, 4th Brigade for some time. 